In the past 10 years, we've seen our energy bills here in the UK rise by 140%. Tomorrow at 7.30, the Tonight programme investigates in how to cut energy bills. Now on ITV, where were you when you heard the news? It's News Flash, stories that stop the world. We're sorry to interrupt this programme, but we have a News Flash. Two planes have crashed into the World Trade Centre. This is the story of breaking news. It's the moment that you stop what you're doing and you think, what? Diana, Princess of Wales, has died after a car crash in Paris. The, the dramatic news flashes which marked unforgettable moments in history. The very fact that they interrupt programmes is a measure of their importance. In this programme, we'll tell the stories behind the stories from the people caught up in events. I was in a terrible state. You know, I thought I was going to die. And those who broke the news to an unsuspecting audience. The military operation to liberate Kuwait has begun. If you're in the television news business and a story like that breaks, this is why you are a television journalist. A Pan Am jumbo jet with more than 250 people on board has crashed at Lockerbie. We're saying directly to millions of people at home, this you need to know. Stay with us, you're watching History in the Making. Television was always intended to deliver drama and surprise, but the news flash has become the most dramatic and unexpected broadcast of them all. Good evening. We have breaking news for you tonight. The singer Michael Jackson is reported to have died from a heart attack. The news flash or a breaking news story is a massive challenge for any TV newsroom. All the systems are dislocated, everything's thrown up in the air. You've just got to start again from scratch. All the plans that you had for the, that day go out the window. There's a definite sense of the pulse starting to race. Delivering the news flash, it is, of course, an enormous responsibility, and you have to do it in a very calm and authoritative way. We interrupt this programme to tell you that war has broken out in the Gulf. You know that you're about to give viewers a piece of truly dramatic news. You're going straight into the living rooms, looking them, as it were, in the eye. You're aware you're doing something really important, something that they might remember for the rest of their lives. The attack on Iraq has started. There's a very difficult dilemma because it's the best possible thing that we do in the news business, the unexpected, the exciting, the breaking news by definition. Hello, we're on air with a special programme this morning with Britain in the grip of its most serious security alert. But nine times out of ten, it involves personal tragedy. In 1997, breaking news of a completely unforeseen tragedy would bring the nation to a halt. People were genuinely shocked. Uh, no one had expected uh, us to be reporting the death of that member of the royal family. In the early hours of a Sunday morning in August, most of the country was asleep, unaware of events that were about to unfold. At one o'clock, my two daughters came into the bedroom and shook me awake, and I thought, oh, no, what, what's going on? And they said, it's the BBC on the phone. I took the call from Mary Greenham, who was the newscaster's organiser, and Mary said, um, can you get in right away, because uh, Diana has been injured in Paris. Jumped into the car, went into the newsroom, and um, it was pretty empty, and we were just trying to gather what information we could. The BBC first broke the news during their late film at around quarter to two. We interrupt this film to tell you we are getting reports that Diana, Princess of Wales, has been badly injured in a car crash in France. And then they said to me, why don't you go home and uh, get your head down and come in at six o'clock? Behind the scenes, newsrooms across the country were faced with a difficult task. The real problem was just not knowing what was going on. But I do remember about an hour after arriving in the newsroom, there was a rumour swirling around that she was less seriously hurt than we thought. It didn't last for long, but there was that rumour going around. We didn't know precisely about the circumstances, but what we had um, was what Princess of Wales had been doing in the previous days and weeks, and it had been an issue that she'd been pursued across the south of France by paparazzi, desperate for pictures because she'd got this relatively new relationship with Dodie Fired incredible intrusion into her life and then this 
a car crash in the middle of the night. So, you know, there was a lot of backstory, but there wasn't, you know, this crucial question, well, how is she, what's happened to her? It was a very challenging night, trying to keep viewers up to date with what was going on, while at the same time trying to find out what was going on. We're interrupting programmes to tell you that Diana, Princess of Wales, is gravely ill in intensive care in Paris's Salpetriere Hospital after being seriously injured in a car crash which killed her friend, the Haradzai Dodi Fayed. It's thought the princess is gravely ill. Unconfirmed reports suggest she has concussion, severe cuts and broken bones. I almost became aware in the tone of voice that, you know, producers were using in my ear and it was kind of, hold on a minute, you know, they were saying, hold on a minute, we're just checking this, and you thought... This doesn't, this doesn't smell right. Dermot Murnahan then heard the news that was about to stun the world. I was told uh, in my ear that uh, she, was, she was dead, that she was not alive. So there is the car being towed away. We are now being told that Diana, Princess of Wales, who was reported to be injured in that accident you've just seen pictured of, has actually died in Paris's Salpetriere Hospital. A, fr a French minister has confirmed the death of the Princess of Wales after a car crash which also killed her friend, the Haradzai, Dodi Fayed. I went in my head, what, but you told us she had a broken collarbone. And you don't, what, you know, but I can't say that, but I'm imagining people at home who are watching, they're gonna go, oh, that, I can't believe it. As a waking nation began to turn on their TV sets, viewers soon discovered the tragic and unexpected news. This is BBC Television from London. Diana, Princess of Wales, has died after a car crash in Paris. When I was called to be told that she had died and to get back into the studio, um, I had a very quiet time in the taxi to actually, to actually think about it and to think about this marvellous woman the fact that she had gone, and also the implications for the nation. But above all, the intense sadness for her two then very young sons. It was for me the biggest professional challenge that I've had in my 32-year television career. We're going, in fact, uh, I believe, to Sedgefield. The challenge of newscasting when you have a major story breaking around you and you are live on air is that you must not convey any emotion to the viewer. You must not convey the emotion of the story. And I remember that the Prime Minister made a very powerful speech. She was the people's princess. And that's how she will stay, how she will remain in our hearts and in our memories forever. The job of the news presenter is to repeat some of the things that the Prime Minister has been saying. Prime Minister Tony Blair, his voice breaking with emotion. And I was doing this and I got to a particular point, a very powerful emotional line, and I started to, I started to crack. The people of Britain, he said, kept faith with Princess Diana. They loved her. She was the people's princess. And then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw the next interviewee coming into the studio uh, to sit down beside me, and I realised I had to pull myself together. And with me in the studio, we have Lord Archer. I don't think any of us could have foreseen that upswelling of public reaction, which is like no other story that we have seen before or since. The devastating news brought to viewers that day mirrored the tragedy which fell upon America 34 years earlier in a news flash that would change breaking news forever. On a warm November morning in 1963, CBS correspondent Dan Rather was in Texas covering John F. Kennedy's presidential visit when chaos broke out. It all happened in a blur. And I, I wasn't certain, but what I thought was the presidential limousine sort of zoomed by. It seemed to me it went in the wrong direction. None of the rest of the motorcade is coming. This sense of, ooh, something may be wrong. I had no idea that shots had been fired. I had no idea what had happened. But something obviously had happened. And so I took off like a, a man with his shirt tail on fire to get back 
uh, to the studio. As soon as I got station, somebody said to me almost immediately, uh, there were shots fired, shots fired, shots fired at the president. Meanwhile, at CBS headquarters in New York, news anchor Walter Cronkite was ready to go on air as the network prepared to interrupt the afternoon schedule. Television cameras of the day were huge machines. It took these cameras 20 minutes or more to warm up to the point where they could transmit a signal. So for the first 20 minutes or half hour, you heard Walter Cronkite's voice. You did not see Walter Cronkite. Here is a bulletin from CBS News. In Dallas, Texas, three shots were fired at President Kennedy's motorcade in downtown Dallas. The first reports say that President Kennedy has been seriously wounded by this shooting. But from that day forward at CBS, uh, the cameras were always on. They were never turned off 24-7. 20 minutes later, Cronkite appeared in vision at his desk. This is Walter Cronkite in our newsroom. There has been an attempt, as perhaps you know now, on the life of President Kennedy. He was wounded in an automobile driving from Dallas Airport into downtown Dallas, along with Governor Connolly of Texas. They've been taken to Parkland Hospital there, where their condition is as yet unknown. We have not it was the condition. birth of breaking news coverage on television which really hadn't existed before. People absolutely stopped doing what they were doing to watch television. Let's see if we can get a real close-up of that picture. It has just arrived. It shows the smiling Mrs. Kennedy and the president in the back seat of the car. In Dallas, Dan Rather had managed to get through to the switchboard operator at Parkland Hospital, desperate for the latest on the president's condition. I begged her to put somebody on the telephone who might know something. She put me on the telephone with priests uh, who just said, lightly, you know, oh, the president is dead. As unconfirmed reports of the president's death started to circulate, Dan Rather relayed what he'd been told back to CBS headquarters. I'm on the open phone line to New York, and they said, uh, what's the situation? And I said to them, uh, the president is dead. We just have a report from our correspondent, Dan, rather in Dallas, that he has confirmed that President Kennedy is dead. There is still no official confirmation of this. However, it's a report from our correspondent, Dan, rather in Dallas, Texas. They didn't accept it as a fact until the official announcement was made. Ten minutes later, Walter Cronkite had final confirmation of the news that would haunt America. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. Vice President Lyndon Johnson <clears throat> has left the hospital. For those Dallas, seconds, we do not know. Walter could no longer keep all of his emotions tamped down within himself. President Kennedy at Dallas Airport this morning uh, was cheerful and waving. At Part of what made Walter Cronkite performance so powerful that day was its integrity, its authenticity. Listen, this is a real reporter in a real newsroom doing what he's been trained to do. President Kennedy is dead of an assassin's bullet in the 46th year of his life. He understood it was a historic moment, not just for him, you know, but for the United States, for television. I'd make the case, and I'm not alone, that the news flash, the bulletin on the air, became a, a clearly defined form from the moment of the Kennedy assassination. This is Walter Cronkite at our CBS newsroom in New York. And now if Charles Collingwood is standing by, Charles will sit in here to keep you advised of further details uh, as this tragic day goes on. In the world of breaking news, pictures from the scene have become vital in relaying the story to millions of viewers. Coming towards us now is Winnie and Nelson Mandela in freedom. From universal moments of celebration. People are still pouring out of West Berlin behind me and pouring in from East Berlin into the West. To tales of tragedy closer to home. But the police, as you can see there, 
taping down uh, articles of evidence. Television needs pictures. You can do a lot without pictures, but it's when pictures are transmitted that so often you see what a story is really about and the scale of a story. In 1966, a catastrophic landslide engulfed a school in Aberfan in South Wales. Local news teams rushed to the scene and recorded the aftermath, making it the first large-scale disaster in Britain to be covered by television cameras. I was working as uh, head of news at a local TV station, TWW Wales in the West. Our cameraman was actually based in Merthyr. He was first there, and we had two 50-foot reels of film came in. It was shot in mute. It did take us a few hours before we could get live pictures out of there. In the meantime, we were handling this very valuable footage. For a regional news station, it was the biggest story I knew that I would ever cover. The roads are full of bulldozers and lorries. As the devastating images from the scene sank in, national news broadcasts kept the country updated. There was an extraordinary surge of interest in the studio when these news flashes came up. More news of the disaster at Aberfan. It now seems certain that nearly 200 lives were lost when the coal tip at Aberfan near Merthyr Tydfil slid forward, engulfing an infant school and a row of houses. As time went on, the details of the uh, story became more and more horrifying. 22 years later, regional television would once again play a crucial role in capturing the first pictures of a breaking news story when tragedy hit a small Scottish town in the days before Christmas. One of the most interesting aspects of a news flash is where you first hear the story. And in the case of Lockerbie, it was at the chance of the Exchequer's drinks party in number 11 Downing Street. We were there, and you could tell in the room that little words and whispers were going round and round. Something had happened, and nobody quite knew what. Shortly after 7 o'clock, the news editor called over to the production desk and said that he was hearing reports of a, uh, a plane crash in southern Scotland. And the first report suggested that the military jet had crashed on a petrol station. And we thought that was a you know, fairly major story, and I think we probably began to think about whether there should be a, a news flash. By the time we got back to ITN, the facts were beginning to emerge. A 747, a huge aeroplane, had suddenly gone off the radar. And then suddenly, huge bits of aircraft were being found close to that fire. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. And eventually, probably within a few minutes, somebody goes, oh my god. We didn't know at that stage, obviously, that there was terrorism involved, but we knew that was an enormous story, and we prepared to go on air with a news flash. As millions of ITV viewers enjoyed a festive entertainment special, the first news flash went on air during a commercial break. A Pan American 747 jumbo jet with 258 people on board has crashed 15 miles north of the Scottish border. The plane took off from London's Heathrow Airport, bound for John F. Kennedy in New York at 6 o'clock this evening. Pan Am flight number 103 disappeared from radar screens 25 miles north of Carlisle. It went down near the town of Lockerbie in Dumfrieshire. The plane crashed into a petrol station close to a housing estate. Eyewitnesses say they saw huge... To get a true sense of the scale of the disaster, pictures from the scene were hugely important. But due to the remote location, that wouldn't be an easy task. It was a story that the national networks couldn't get to. It was just too far. I mean, Lockerbie is probably you know, three hours from you know, Manchester at the very easiest, five, six hours from London, miles from anywhere. And if it hadn't been for a good regional setup, the coverage would have been quite, quite different. By the time the first news flash had aired, border producer Ian Fisher was already leading the first television crew into Lockerbie. What we found as we came north was that the road was blocked by traffic. They couldn't get any further because of the debris that was on the road. And we were faced with a bit of a problem. What did we do? We were a mile short of Lockerbie. But at that point, fate smiled on us, and a fire engine on its way to the scene coming out of Carlisle came up on the opposite side of the carriageway. Our electrician, he had the, the good sense to pull across onto the other carriageway and follow it in. And then we were into Lockerbie. 
by now I could see that we were getting very close to the, the flames which were across here in the, the next road back. And we came across the entrance to the name that the media focused on so much. The scene on the night when we arrived here was very different from how it is now. It was the best word to use is apocalyptic. The houses here were all on fire, the smoke was acrid, it was difficult to breathe. And utterly by chance, we had come to one of the two focal points of the night. A Pan Am jumbo jet with more than 250 people on board has crashed at Lockerbie, 15 miles north of the Scottish border. The plane is As ITV interrupted programmes to keep viewers updated, it was down to Ian Fisher to get the dramatic pictures back to border television in Carlisle. We had no satellite facilities, so getting that tape back to border was really important. There was someone sitting by a tape machine with lines already connected to ITN in London. The tape was put into the machine and I saw the pictures start to be played out. And at that point, I looked at the clock on the wall and it said five to ten. And I thought, will ITN manage to use this in time? Unknown casualties as Pan Am jet crashes on a Scottish village. Eyewitnesses describe an explosion and a 300-foot fireball. Houses and cars are set on fire by burning debris. Without border television that night, viewers across the country wouldn't have seen those first pictures. The first pictures from the devastated town of Lockerbie show a string of houses set ablaze by the jet as it exploded in flames. The Pan Am Jumbo had been following its normal flight path north over Scotland. We went on to make a further special program with more pictures from the scene and were able to report the you know, truly awful events and began to give a, a sense of the scale of what happened. As the day of the worst terrorist atrocity the UK had ever seen drew to a close, ITV continued to break into its schedule as more pictures and information about the ill-fated Pan Am Flight 103 filtered back to London. At Dumfries Infirmary, doctors and nurses rushed from their homes to prepare for what they expected to be a mass of casualties. For me, the most chilling confirmation of the scale of the event was when the head of A&E came out in his white coat and he said, um, there will be no casualties. Well, at the moment, we feel that we are not going to have any large number of casualties. And in a split second, we kind of thought, ah, it's OK. And then in another split second, realised that what he was saying was, i.e., there are no injured to look after. They're all dead. Lockerbie changed the lives of a lot of people, whether it was the relatives of those who died on the flight, people here in Lockerbie who had to endure its aftermath, or those of my colleagues who came to cover it. So Lockerbie has left its mark on all of us. I don't think you can ever forget that it's about people and their tragedy, and it could have been you. You know, if that aircraft had crashed a little bit further down, it would have been my house, my children. You can't forget that, and especially in regional news, that's very, very real to you. These were our viewers. One of the most extraordinary things about Lockerbie and the news flashes that we did was that we were reporting the preamble to what became world-changing events. It was a massive, ghastly act of terrorism that wasn't exceeded until 9-11, in many respects. We believe that a plane has crashed into the World Trade Center in New York. The live coverage of the horror brought to our screens on September the 11th, 2001, was a watershed moment in the history of breaking news. It is unfolding before our eyes, this terrible, terrible scene in New York. 9-11 was an absolutely enormous world event, and it was caught live on camera. And it was caught live on camera because in the previous few years, so many cameras have been deployed around the world, cameras on buildings, individuals in the street with cameras, and we saw the awful, tragic events of 9-11 from so many different angles. 
just the accessibility to picture and live coverage um, reached a scale that it had never reached before. I gather, Tom, that you have uh, some breaking news on Watching the Watching stories develop live as they unfold is something viewers today take for granted. from the Metropolitan Police. And in an age where over a hundred rolling news channels exist, broadcasters around the world can deliver. Good evening, I'm David Walker. The very first 24-hour news channel began in 1980, when American businessman Ted Turner founded the cable news network CNN. Breaking news would never be the same again. Before CNN was set up, lots of people say, well, there's not enough news going on in the world for a 24-hour news channel. Ted Turner had a vision that there was um, and proved it, and I think that real transition of that was probably the first Gulf War, where CNN and others showed that rolling news was a format that could work. Operation Desert Storm began on January the 16th, 1991, after Saddam Hussein failed to meet the United Nations deadline for the Iraqi withdrawal from Kuwait. At the time, CNN was the only station broadcasting live from Baghdad, so ITN took their feed. CNN scored a kind of world exclusive, not because they had pictures that anybody, uh, you know, that other people didn't have, but because they actually simply had a man talking down a sound line, which other people didn't have. And we just heard, whoa, holy cow, that was a large airburst that we saw. It was a filling the sky. If you're still with us, you can hear the bombs now. They are hitting the center of this city. Having this sound circuit with CNN from Baghdad enabled us to hear that, you know, the bombing had started and to decide to go on the air. Around the time war was breaking out, viewers watching ITV were catching up with the latest football highlights. Good evening on quarterfinals night in the Rumbelows League Cup. The highlights programmes were really important to football fans, so there'd been an enormous number of people watching. Oh, Chapman! It was a very strange sort of situation because you knew the war could start at any time, the invasion. But on that particular night, I do remember, we had a message that it was highly likely to happen. And we'd been warned that if a big story broke, the teleprinters, which were in the studio, would suddenly ring bells. And we'd come out of one game, which was, I think, Leeds-Aston Villa, and we were all set to go to another game when I heard the bells ringing and got the producer in the ear saying, it's happening, go. We also hope to bring you more football to come here on Midweek Sports Special, but first of all, it's time for a news flash from ITN. It's reported that anti-aircraft fire has begun over the skies of Baghdad. Correspondents are talking about the skies lighting up and huge traces emerging from bunkers. Earlier, there were sounds of explosions. I was just sort of uh, watching the stuff coming from ITN, wondering what was happening. Would the show go on? But ITN's uninterrupted coverage first goes over to the American... We waited a good hour or so before we knew for certain that we could go home. But it was a very dramatic night. We're going over now to America's cable news network. We'll be bringing you the latest reports and information from our own correspondents in the Middle East. ITV stayed with CNN for the next 45 minutes before viewers were brought back to the news studio in London. Those reports from the American television network, Cable Network News. Now, in case you've just joined us, let me bring you up to date on the news which broke just about an hour ago. The military operation to liberate Kuwait has begun. I was asked by Stuart Purvis, uh, at I think it must have been around midnight, to go into the studio and do a one-minute up summer. The action is being called Desert Storm. Halfway through, I heard Stuart in the control room say, keep going! Let me tell you that ITN will be staying on the air throughout the night to bring you up to date with all the developments. Then, after a while, um, interviewees started to come in. And Mr O'Neill, what did you make of his statement? I well, kept on air, I kept on air. I'm just joined by the leader of the Liberal Democrats, Paddy Ashdown. He's just None of us expected that we would keep going until 6 o'clock in the morning. Because of the planning that we'd been able to put into place, we had our best correspondence out there. First of all, straight over to Sandy Gall in Saudi Arabia. Sandy. Good morning. Hello, John. How are you? Good morning. And I think John, it proved you? that the combination of having a strong studio team with reporters and correspondents on location via satellite technology is a very effective way of covering a breaking story. But certainly, as dawn breaks here in eastern Saudi Arabia, 
there is a great sense of, of momentous days lying ahead for the British Armed Forces. Thank you very much indeed. We'll be coming back to you soon. If you're in the television news business and a story like that breaks, this is why you are a television journalist. And I just, ah, oh, I just loved it. And I look back at it now and get quite emotional even thinking about it. For now, though, over to TV AM and Maya Even. John Suchet finally came off the air at 6 a.m. and all night reporting on the Gulf War was to become a regular feature of the TV schedules. It wasn't just the first night, we, we were open-ended for night after night. I think that's fair to say that it did set the pattern for how we then um, carried out opening the coverage over the next 10 to 15 years. Up until that night in 1991, it was events which took place just over a decade earlier that gave ITV its longest ever news flash when the siege at the Iranian embassy drew to a dramatic close. Five days earlier, a group of six gunmen had stormed the embassy building in Prince's Gate. It wasn't long before their demands started to make breaking news. That's the latest news from ITN on the developments in the siege at the Iranian embassy. We'll join Peter Sissons. The second deadline in the Iranian embassy siege, set for two o'clock, passed a short time ago. That means the gunmen haven't carried out their threat to blow up the building and their hostages. They're demanding the release of 91 prisoners in Iran. As the world's media descended, the waiting game began. All the television equipment was kind of lined up in the street. Uh, it, was, it was like a Hollywood set in a way. ITN had an outside broadcast unit set up close by, directed by David Goldsmith. We put a cherry picker in the middle of the road on the side, and that for several days was really the only way that we could see what was going on. There were two elements to the coverage. One was something we had that pretty much everyone had, which was cameras at the front of the building looking at the building. And then ITN had arranged secretly to smuggle in, without any of the authorities knowing, a camera at the back of the building, just in case something happened. It became obvious that these flats here were absolutely crucial if I was going to get a view at the rear of the embassy at ITN negotiated with the owner of a flat that I had located and we got permission to use his flat. The hidden camera would play an essential role in the remarkable events that began to unfold on the sixth day of the story's coverage. We'd done the 540 and gone outside to get something to eat and I took it back into the scanner, the outside broadcast scanner, and was watching the monitor for something to do and that's when I saw the two figures on the roof at the back of the building. Following the revelation that a hostage had been killed by the terrorists, the green light was given to send in the SAS. It was very dramatic, clearly very dramatic, when the SAS were doing the abseiling and I was screaming at ITN, put me to where, put me to where, this is incredible, look at these pictures. Master control simply refused. Eventually, an excuse came down the line from somewhere that Coronation Street couldn't be interrupted. And I just couldn't believe it. I was so frustrated after five days and five nights. I thought, this is absurd. I only realized really later was that if that camera at the back of the building had actually been plugged right through to us live, we would have shown the SAS about to go in, possibly to the people, the terrorists inside the building, who we know were watching television. And I have to say, it's not a situation I kind of slept very easily about and, and have, have ever done since. But luck, as much as judgment, Coronation Street was coming towards a close. So we agreed between us that as Coronation Street came to a close, we would interrupt the network and go live to the embassy and start the coverage and we'd finish it when we finished it. And now once again, we're going over to ITN in London. These are the dramatic scenes at the Iranian embassy in London at the moment. The Iranian in the embassy. last couple of moments, several bombs have gone off, shots have been fired. It seems as though all hell is broken loose in Kenny. Both ITV and the BBC broke into their schedules to go on air with pictures from the scene. The nation was gripped as the SAS set about rescuing the hostages. 
one of which was BBC sound recordist Sim Harris, who had visited the embassy to collect a visa, but was now caught up in the live drama being broadcast into millions of homes. Well, the first thing I was aware of some sort of attack was when our lights went out and all hell broke loose. The window blows out with me about a foot behind it. And then the SAS came in and told me to stay down. <laughs> Having spoken to them, it was bloody close. If I'd have got there a few seconds later, that explosion would have just gone into my face. I crawled onto the balcony. There were people out in the main road. They kept shouting, stay down, stay down. But eventually the room started burning and debris dropping on me. Smoke is coming out of the first floor windows. I can see flames there, there are flames. You know, I was shouting, I'm burning, and they just said, stay where you are. I was in a terrible state. You know, I thought I was going to die. I now hear that Sim Harris has been released. Sim Harris, the BBC sound recordist who's been a hostage for six days, has been released. And eventually I was called into a window over here and then we were bundled out by the SAS, literally thrown out onto the back lawn. The hostages are coming out of the Iranian embassy, out of a building, half of it on fire. I still get the jitters when I walk past. Talking about it again, the adrenaline starts to flow, and I just think how lucky I was. It was a hugely risky rescue. Fellow hostages died and were injured in it. I came out virtually unscathed. I was very lucky. And it is now quite clear that the police are satisfied that they have ended the siege. The building is secure in their terms. 40 minutes after ITV had cut to the news flash, the unplanned broadcast drew to a close. Up until then, a news flash never exceeded two minutes. And we didn't give it a second thought. In fact, the news flash became the longest news flash in television history. This is Anthony Carthew, ITN in Prince's Gate. Good evening. Breaking news tonight. Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, has been taken to hospital. Over the decades, breaking news about the British monarchy has repeatedly interrupted programming. The royal family are our premier family in the country. Anything that happens to them um, is, by definition, of national importance. Hello, John. From the latest on their health... What's happening about the Queen Mother? Well, we've just heard that the Queen Mother's actually broken her collarbone. ...to moments of national celebration. After months of speculation, the picture the photographers were waiting for. Well, I've had the wonderful experience of doing some happy breaking news, which was the birth of Prince George. Good evening. It is a boy. The Duchess of Cambridge gave birth to a son at 4.24 this afternoon. And actually, something like that is a real pleasure to do because it makes a change from the death and disaster that normally news flashes portray. Well, it's bedlam here at the moment. In fact, the royal family were the subject of the very first TV news flash on the BBC in 1955, delivered by a young Richard Baker. Princess Margaret decided that she would not marry Group Captain Townsend, and this was thought worthy of a news flash. All the top brass of the BBC were lined up in our rather small studio to decide whether or not to put this announcement out. And they did, and that was the first news flash on BBC television news. There have been many unexpected news stories about the royal family, but inevitably there are some life events for which broadcasters can be prepared. I think some people might find it genuinely odd that we rehearse certain news flashes, particularly the deaths of senior members of the royal family but it's done for the best possible reasons, because it simply means that when it comes, whether it's in half an hour's time or in 10 years' time, we stand a better chance of giving you a better service. Before the Queen Mother, 
uh, we'd actually been rehearsing the coverage of her death for many years because it was in everyone's interest that when the event was announced, it was, a, it was announced in a professional way. What was particularly interesting, we, our last rehearsal was on the weekend before she actually died. It was an Easter Saturday, um, very sunny. I'd been quite grumpy about going into work. Everything was completely normal. We didn't have a hint of anything. We were coming to the end of our scheduled tea time bulletin and I got a top line message on my computer from Nick Walsh, the news editor, saying, hearing the Queen Mother's died. I sent him a, a message back that was serious, question mark, and I got one back from him, serious, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. And that's all for now. I'll be back with more news at a 20 to 9. Until then, bye-bye. I became aware of a, a, a sort of a commotion in my ear. And as the credits rolled, my editor said to me, right, don't move, we're going back on air. In two and a half minutes, the Queen Mother's died. And at that moment, you get a real rush of thinking, right, what am I going to do? Microsoft says it's a very real... Over on the BBC, millions of viewers were spending their Easter Saturday watching an outtake show when the programme was suddenly cut short. This is BBC One. We're interrupting our programme for an important announcement. This is BBC Television News. Buckingham Palace has just announced the death of the Queen Mother. In a statement, the Palace said the Queen Mother has died. BBC Television is broadcasting this special programme reporting the Queen Mother's death. With the BBC already on air, ITV News had to act quickly. I was actually in a cottage in a pretty remote part of Norfolk. I remember having two phones. So on one hand, I was talking to the network, and they said, yep, you can break into the programmes now. And on the other hand, I had a direct hotline through to the control room. Nigel was very, very keen that we got on air very, very quickly. I remember having quite a blue phone uh, glued to my ear, uh, asking me why we weren't on air or words to that effect. My kind of main memory of that afternoon is, in the end, shouting quite loudly, Nick, just get on air. Just get on air. My response was, we need to be ready. I just want to be ready. In a statement, the Looking back on it, that was absolutely the best decision I made. That meant that the director was calm, I was calm, and more importantly and crucially, Mary was calm. Just moments later, ITV interrupted their programming as Mary Nightingale prepared to deliver the biggest breaking news story of her career. I was listening to the countdown in my ear and I was just thinking, get it right. Just get it right. Good evening. We're on the air with this special programme because Buckingham Palace has just announced the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. I was actually relatively new at ITN at that point, and so, you know, I did feel quite a lot of pressure was upon me not to mess up. Buckingham Palace said that she died peacefully in her sleep this afternoon at Royal Lodge, Windsor. My voice is quite high. <laughs> I think I was more nervous than I realised. The Queen Mother's last public appearance was in November last year. As both channels went live into open-ended coverage, reporters and correspondents were called upon to keep the newsrooms and viewers updated. Well, our royal correspondent, Jenny Bond, uh, joined us on the phone. Um, Jenny, can you add anything to that? Well, yes, I heard the news as I was driving, and um, I turned around. I'm driving, obviously, back to London now. Thank goodness it was hands-free. I was driving and trying to give this very grave news, um, and, you know, I, I succeeded, I hope, in getting the tone just about right. In the words of uh, Margaret Rose, I say the Queen Mother's niece, that the body just finally gave up. The breaking news coverage of the passing of a national treasure inevitably attracted much comment in the press. Peter Sissons was criticised for not wearing a black tie when he broke the news. My recollection is that we had been told that it was no longer um, deemed essential to wear black, but sombre, sober colours. And he was wearing something perfectly um, sombre. I think I felt very sorry for Peter Sissons because he's a brilliant broadcaster who did an amazing job. I was wearing pale grey. I didn't have time to change into anything. So had I been wearing a red jacket, I too could have been absolutely castigated. 
But we end this programme now with a moment of reflection and a brief look back at the Queen Mother's long and eventful life. Goodbye. The royal family are at the centre of national life. Many, many millions of Britons are very interested in the major events that affect them, and it's right that television reports that properly, and that will, you know, on occasions lead to news flashes, and I, I don't see that changing. President Kennedy is dead of an assassin's bullet. We believe that a plane has crashed into the World Trade Center. For over 50 years, the news flash has been a surprising and momentous visitor into our homes. A Pan Am jumbo jet with more than 250 people on board has crashed at Lockerbie 50... We were reporting the preamble to what became world-changing events. Diana, Princess of Wales, has been killed in a car accident. Millions of people are finding out this most unexpected and enormous news. The military operation to liberate Kuwait has begun. I was aware that I was delivering history as it was happening. But in the age of rolling news and the internet, and with every owner of a mobile device now able to report live from the scene, what does the future hold for breaking news? There's a very good chance that by the time you get to your news flash, that a good part of your audience will already heard the story through Twitter or through one of their social networks. So I think we are moving into a different world. So breaking news to bring you, it comes from Scotland Yard. We're so used to breaking news all the time now. But mega events, dramatic events, will always stop us in our tracks, I think. For us to break into our programming, or the BBC to break into its programming, is something of great significance. The razor of Calcutta. We're saying more important than any of that is this. Yeah.